to our court system will continue to be a central focus on how we want to improve our justice system within Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement. And we turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12958 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the contribution of culture, visitor attractions and events to Scotland's economy and society. I'd be grateful if members could change seats as quickly as possible because we have no extra time available for this debate. I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 13 minutes maximum, please. Presiding Officer, in moving the motion in my name, I'm pleased to open this debate on the role of culture, visitor attractions and events and how they play our, into our society and the economy of Scotland. Here in Scotland, we have an incredibly rich and diverse culture and a calendar of events which we treasure and celebrate. Culture is key to our quality of life and well-being. It roots us in place and shapes how we think of ourselves and how others see us. It challenges the way we think and expands our horizons. Culture makes a vital contribution to Scotland's economy, supporting recovery and increasing sustainable economic growth, and is part of the fabric of our society. And all this means uh, culture is a key contributor in delivering the First Minister's One Scotland approach to government. The strategic priorities set out in the new programme for government are based on the three key themes of creating more better paid jobs in a strong sustainable economy, building a fairer Scotland and tackling inequality and passing power to peoples and communities. Let me continue. The cultural sector has a significant role to play in taking forward all three of these priorities. And engaging with culture is life enhancing in its own right, but it's also known to have a positive impact on our well-being and quality of life. Evidence shows a significant association between cultural engagement and good health and life satisfaction. Analysis of the Scottish Household Survey data found that those who attended a cultural or historic place or event were almost 60% more likely to report good health than those who did not attend. They were also more than 50% more likely to report high life satisfaction. And that sense of connection with place is key to the sense of well-being in our community. And the Scottish Household Survey data demonstrates the high value people in Scotland place on our culture and heritage, showing that in 2013, 91% of adults engaged in cultural activities and 89% agreed agreeing that it is important to me that heritage buildings and places are well looked after, end quote. But there's no room for complacency, however. We must continue to widen access and participation so that all Scotland's people can benefit from all that culture has to offer. And we have a wealth of examples demonstrating the achievements of the sector. Our place in time, the historic environment strategy, makes increasing participation in heritage a priority, and there is a dedicated group established to take this forward. Our work under the umbrella of Scotland's youth art strategy, Time to Shine, is similarly designed to ensure that no one's background is a barrier to taking part in cultural life. And it's supported by initiatives, including the Youth Music Initiative and Cashback for Creativity. And Aspire Dundee is an innovative project taking place in nine Dundee primary schools in areas of high deprivation, enabling 2,000 young people to take part in music, dance or drama. And I recently had the pleasure of visiting Sidlaw View Primary School to see the project in action, and I was deeply impressed by the impact it is having on young people's lives. And at Galgale in Glasgow, the Journey On programme uses traditional building skills as a practical focus for people who have suffered such hardships as unemployment, depression or addiction. And the programme helps them pick up new skills as well as build greater personal capacity and resilience. Through these and many more, the Scottish Government is working with the sector to ensure that everyone in Scotland has the opportunity to enjoy and benefit and access our culture and heritage. And in addition to these inspiring projects, Scotland's local museums, galleries and libraries are all cornerstones of our communities, providing places to tell our stories locally and contributing to health and well-being, education and community uh, engagement. And local museums can provide a valuable lifeline for the communities they serve, providing opportunities to connect with others and address social deprivation and mental health issues facing the community. And the Festival of Museums on the 15th to 17th of May this year is an opportunity to celebrate what our museums have to offer and include activities across Scotland. Neil Finley. Neil Finley. I absolutely agree with her and what she's saying in our museums, but they're only good if they're open. And last week, the National Museum was closed for two days because of an industrial dispute that's been going on for 18 months. When's the minister going to get a grip of this situation? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, well clearly, uh, any closure of a museum is to be regretted. I, I have encouraged the uh, unions to cooperate uh, with the management and vice versa in terms of the management. You must be aware in terms of uh, National Museum that National Museum in Wales is actually looking to remove, and of course Wales is run by a Labour government, is looking to remove weekend working allowance from existing staff. Existing staff in the National Museum still retain a weekend working allowance. But he's right um, to, to pay tribute to the staff, as I always have done in this chamber. It's very important that we recognise the role of museums that they play and in terms of difficulty in terms of public finances. I'm very proud and pleased through a period of recession we have managed to keep our museums free of act for access uh, for the public and that will remain uh, in terms of what I would want to see in terms of progress and I would want not, not, want, not want anything to put that in jeopardy. I also want to, uh, President Officer, recognise our libraries and the importance of our libraries. They have a crucial role to play in helping to tackle inequalities and to empower communities. And our cultural and creative industries make a substantial contribution to the economy and sustainable economic growth. They attract tourism, support employment and skills development as a driving force for regeneration. Scotland is well established as a leading events destination, attracting significant numbers of visitors to Scotland and yielding benefits for the economy while enhancing Scotland's international profile and reputation. And our heritage and visitor attractions are the lifeblood of our vibrant tourism industry, with 43% of first-time visitors to Scotland stating that they choose to come here to learn more about Scotland's history and culture. And the historic environment is estimated to contribute in excess of £2.3 billion to Scotland's national gross, gross value-added economic growth and to account for 2.5% of Scotland's total employment. And investing in our cultural heritage infrastructure can deliver a wide range of economic and social benefits. Take New Lanark, for example, in the early 1990s, 70s, much of the village lay redundant and demolition of many of the buildings was a genuine possibility. The decision was taken to invest in and revive the village with the intention of maximising its potential to generate income in the long term, both from housing as well as visitors. And 40 years on, New Lanark is a flourishing UNESCO World Heritage Site and a living, working community with the majority of the buildings restored and a community of 65 households. And New Lanark is a centre for renewable energy production and an award-winning education and access programme, attracting over 20,000 visitors each year. It provides direct employment for over 150 people through a hotel, hostel, um, visitor uh, centre and the manufacture and sale of wool and textiles and contributes £7 million annually to the region's economy. And uh, looking backwards uh, for the last year, uh, President Officer, I think we should reflect that 2014 was a momentous year for Scotland in our cultural sector, with hundreds of events across the country celebrating the best of Scotland's culture and creativity. The Commonwealth Games uh, had a highly successful cultural programme. Of course, we had the Ryder Cup, the second year of homecoming, the second International Culture Summit, and the 700th anniversary of Bannockburn, not to mention the many diverse festivals and cultural events taking place all over the country and cementing Scotland's position as a world-leading events destination. And the Glasgow 2014 cultural programme referred to uh, in the motion was the most ambitious na national cultural celebration ever to take place in this country. It provided a wonderful opportunity for us to share our great cultural traditions and our contemporary creativity with visitors from all over the Commonwealth. Now, the final evaluation is due to be launched in the near future, and I will keep members fully informed in this, but we already have some headline figures which show that over 2,000 events took place involving thousands of artists, performers and participants across hundreds of locations and venues the length and breadth of Scotland. Over three quarters of a million people attended the Festival 2014 Live Zones at Glasgow Green, Calvin Grove Bandstand, Merchant City and BBC at the Quay. And the programme included Generation, a landmark series of exhibitions celebrating 25 years of contemporary art in Scotland. It featured the work of over 100 artists in more than 60 venues, and it actually attracted 1.3 million visitors. Uh, I was lucky enough to see exhibitions in Edinburgh, Orkney, and Thurso. A huge statement about the continuing dynamism of art in Scotland and its place in the world as it inspires audiences. Alice Smith. I, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention, and I absolutely agree wholeheartedly with a very complimentary um, speech that she's making about Scotland's culture that's absolutely clear. Would she also admit, however, that because of that increase in enjoyment of the culture and greater participation, that that is putting very considerable um, 
pressure on the funding of it and that is something that the government will have to address particularly if there is to be free access to our uh, best facilities. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, I've already mentioned in terms of our galleries and museums, that's an important part of our experience. And she's right to say that in difficult times, uh, across different governments that can be pressures on the culture budget. To date, both local government and indeed national government, there hasn't been any disproportionate reduction for, for culture. But uh, any uh, support I can have across the chamber in recognition of the increased demand, that's an appreciation we have of culture, both from the experiences I've talked about, but also from Curriculum for Excellence, the Youth Music Initiative creating more demand, our Youth Art Strategy creating de more demand and interest in provision, but it's a point well made. So in terms of where we are just now, the experiences of the last year and in these other measures as I've mentioned are really uh, upping our game in terms of our audience participation and access and in terms of our festivals whether they're small or big uh, international and outlook or community focus they are a hugely important aspect of our culture celebrating showcasing um, our, our culture and creativity from St Magnus International Festival in Orkney to the Lithgow's party in the palace uh, examples uh, the range uh, across the range of our, our, of our experiences and we also must acknowledge that Edinburgh festivals continue to provide a gateway for the Scottish population to share new and exciting cultural experiences. And, and also, I think it's quite interesting the number of local people that do attend the Edinburgh festivals counter per, to perhaps uh, people's understanding. And they have seen record attendances and box office figures uh, achieved actually during the period of the summer of the Commonwealth Games, which was a, a fantastic achievement. Contributing to our tourism um, business, if you look at the, the role of our, our, our opportunity uh, looking at what the festivals provide, uh, they generate 261 million to the Scottish economy, 41 million spent in accommodation, 37 million in our cafes and bars. So, if we look at the phenomenal number of people attending our festivals, our cultural events in 2014, you saw Scotland outperforming the rest of the UK with a 10% increase in visitor numbers to Scottish attractions. Many of the 600,000 uh, people attending the Commonwealth Games also enjoyed uh, the wealth of attractions in Glasgow. Glasgow's Riverside Transport Museum saw an incredible 41.8% increase in visitors, a 39% increase in the Scottish National Gallery, much of it to do with the Generation Programme, but also a 6% increase at Urquhart Castle and a 7% increase in Stirling Castle. And the total visits to Scotland from overseas between January and September 2014 also increased by 12%. So, in terms of going forward, our, our national and international successes clearly demonstrate Scotland has a thriving culture and how important that is to making, to making Scotland a greater place to live, work and study and visit. Um, but we can't rest on our laurels. We, can, can, we need to continue to nurture and develop our artists and our cultural life, investing in our cultural infrastructure, encouraging skills development and creating further opportunities. We look forward to coming years. Uh, of course, we have a, a number of events commemorating the First World War. We also, this year, the pre I see the presentation of the 2015 Turner Prize at Glasgow's tramway. So the, uh, the Edinburgh festivals continue to go from strength to strength. We've seen a 25% increase in ticket sales in the space of just two years. And of course, we wish Fergus Linehan best wishes for this, his first Edinburgh International Festival as director. Our festivals, events, heritage, our vibrant cultural life, of course, do so much more than provide uh, for our society and our, our, our economy. They provide windows for transformation, both personally and for our communities, bringing uh, understanding and appreciation of other cultures and experiences. They challenge and celebrate the human spirit and tell our stories. And that is why I'm proud this government continues to invest in and nurture these important assets. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 12958.2. Maximum nine minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I very much welcome this afternoon's debate. Scotland has a rich and diverse cultural and artistic life, one which is built on centuries of traditional music and storytelling, but one which is now expansive, multicultural, innovative and world-leading. Our cultural experiences embrace our past while telling the story of today and of the future. We are very fortunate to have a rich historic environment, a wide selection of collections at museums and galleries, a growing creative sector with a focus on new media, internationally recognised festivals and a network of artistic and creative groups across Scotland who are encouraging and supporting participation. All of these contribute significantly to Scotland being a great place to live, work and to visit. 
It is right that we use some of this afternoon's time to celebrate, recognise and value what Scotland's culture, visitor attractions and events give us. We have national companies which are growing in stature. The new developments at the National Theatre are very exciting and Scottish Ballet are touring their production of Streetcar Named Desire and the opening sales weekend of the Edinburgh Festival was the busiest yet. As well as bringing a way to bring history to life and tell our own story, our historic environment has been a long-time attraction for visitors to Scotland and has a vital part to play in promoting the country, particularly in film and TV sector. Um, historic Scotland have seen figures, have seen year-on-year -year growth in visitors, with the recent winter months recording a record-breaking number of visitors, up 10% on the previous year. Um, Stirling Castle saw a remarkable increase of 63% on the previous year when it hosted the Great Scottish Tapestry, and I'm looking forward to it coming to Gercoda Galleries um, this summer. The tapestry is the perfect example of the coming together of history, craft, community, storytelling, cultural inclusiveness, and identity. And Alexander McCall Smith, Andrew Crummy, and Alistair Muffet are to be thanked for their initiative and leadership on this project. Um, the Cabinet Secretary talked about the success of the Commonwealth Games cultural programme. And last year, the whole of the Commonwealth was able to enjoy not just the sport on offer in Glasgow, but also our thriving cultural community across the country. And Scotland is rightly proud both of our rich history and of our multiculturalism. And our arts sector is a great example of how we can marry the two together. And the Commonwealth Games afforded us the perfect opportunity to showcase this to the world. Um, events like the Glasgow Mela, which already established, were able to promote and play a prominent role in the year of celebration. And hopefully this year, which is the 25th anniversary of the Mela in Glasgow, will be the biggest and the best yet. Um, Scotland's festival programme is wide-ranging and exciting and at the start of the year we all debated the winter festivals and recognised the contribution these festivals make to our economy and our cultural life. Um, the festivals programme continues to grow from our established city festivals to an increasing number of regional festivals bringing variety to local programmes as highlighted by Liz Smith's amendment. Along with everything else Scotland has to offer, our festivals enhance our international reputation. Of course, one of Scotland and the UK's biggest festivals is Tea in the Park, and Tea in the Park generates 15.4 million for the Scottish economy and some 2.7 million at a local level. It attracts international acts to Scotland, ensuring that Scotland is a vibrant part of the festival circuit. And having been based at Balado for many years, it is in the process of currently uh, moving site. Clearly, this is at a planning stage with Perth and Kinross Council, with a decision which is due to be made next month. It is up to the Council to make the decision based on the facts before them. But we should today recognise the social, cultural and economic importance of the festival. And as a Mid-Scotland and Fife MSP, I recognise their previous good environmental record at the Balado site, where it was the only UK festival to be awarded the Green Air Festival Award for seven years running. Um, also, as Labour's amendment recognises, alongside commercial activity, there's also a wide range of cultural activity supported by volunteers that people of all ages across Scotland engage with. There are multiple benefits from cultural engagement, and often as we progress through life, we increasingly become the audience rather than the creator. There should be more encouragement and opportunity to do both, and in May, Voluntary Arts Week will encourage people from across the UK to try something new. And over half the UK adult population is involved in some kind of regular voluntary arts activity from choirs and ceramics to dance and drawing. We don't tend to think of this as a crucial part of Scotland's economy, but these activities often support smaller venues and small local businesses, helping support viable local economies. These opportunities can be transformative for community engagement, good mental health and self-confidence. All these activities, and more that I'm sure others will talk about this afternoon, support a growing confidence of a country. Its ex creative expression is a key ingredient of a healthy, productive, vibrant, modern country, and I'm proud of what we achieve here in Scotland. But we also need to better understand the engagement that is happening. Um, the Cabinet Secretary made some comments about the recent household survey, and it does make some interesting points about engagement, attendance and participation in culture. We know that they have a whole range of activities. Creative Scotland regularly funded organisations alone delivered some 62,000 performances, over 9,000 exhibitions and almost 15,000 screenings last year. But how wide and how deep is that reach? There are positive figures. 91% of adults had engaged in culture through attendance or participation at a cultural event. However, there are some interesting figures which make it clear that there's much more to do if we are to get the greatest benefit from Scottish cultural activity. An individual's level of education and income are key. 
Attendance at cultural events is highest for those from the most prosperous areas and those with the highest level of qualifications. The difference in attending a cultural event between those with the highest level of qualification compared to those with no qualifications is a difference between 93% and 53%. Likewise, there's a gap of 18 points between the most prosperous 20% and the most deprived 20%. There are similar indications of exclusion for people who have long-term physical or mental health conditions who are also less likely to attend cultural events. And the participation in cultural events tells the same story. Participation is lowest for those in the most deprived areas, those with the lowest qualifications and people with a long-term health condition. There are also significant differences in the age profile and attendance at cultural events decreases with age with the decline starting to accelerate in the over 45s. And that is concerning because artistic and cultural experiences are what brings meaning, enjoyment, social interaction to our lives and that's important for all ages. Uh, this is all significant. We all recognise this afternoon the value of cultural activity and yet too many people appear to be excluded. Do we fully understand the reasons for that? What steps are we taking to address this? And where should public policy and funding be directed if we want to see greater, more equitable engagement in culture? Firstly, it needs to be recognised and addressed. Um, much of this is done at local level by our local authorities and our cultural trusts, and we need to support that activity. There's a lot going on in Scotland, and, but I'll briefly mention Glasgow Life, who are doing a lot of work to engage some of Scotland's most deprived communities. In a time of financial constraint, the arts can come under pressure with no statutory protection. But we need to recognise and promote the value of what it brings to individuals and our communities. Um, our amendment today highlights the Welcome Culture Accounts campaign, which since 2011 has played a role in articulating the importance of our cultural life. It provides a platform for a discussion of future policy and is an advocate for the value of culture in its widest sense. Um, an amendment also talks about people working in the sector and in closing there are a few points I want to make about this. Um, firstly, while the focus is often on the performers, there is a whole host of technicians, support staff, engineers working across the sector. And I recently visited Pitlockley Theatre, I know the Cabinet Secretary was there last year too, and they talked to me about the skills gaps in theatre technicians and the difficulty there can be in getting the appropriate training and experience in Scotland. The creative industries are a, gross, uh, a growth sector increasingly important to our national economy, as well as an important tool for regeneration of regions and communities. And we need to ensure we have the right skills coming through in the sector. In addition to this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm afraid the member has to close. In addition to this, there are infrastructure needs. Um, there is a need for venue viability, and the Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the recent journey of the Bayer Theatre and the support needed by the Beacon Arts Centre. These kind of venues are important for delivering cultural experiences outside of our cities, and we do need to ensure we have a strong regional network. Um, there are issues of low pay and, in some cases, no pay across the sector. The Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the ongoing dispute at Museum Scotland, which is leading to strike action at some of our most well-known and visited museums. This needs to be resolved, and as the direct funder of the National Museums, the Cabinet Secretary does have a responsibility here. There is also the Work Not Play campaign from the Musicians' Union, which challenges practices of no pay or very little pay for performances. If we are to have a vibrant, varied, exciting cultural sector, we need to support artists to make a living. Um, President Officer, I welcome the opportunity to argue for the importance of Scotland's cultural and artistic community this afternoon, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 12958.1, maximum six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, could I move the amendment in my name and also indicate that we're very happy to support the Scottish Government motion and also uh, the Labour Party's uh, amendment. I think, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, it's very hard to overstate the enormous contribution that Scotland's culture and the associated events and uh, visitor attractions to our economy and society uh, actually make. On the one hand, the very positive uh, economic impact in terms of job creation and economic growth is unmistakable, but I think just as importantly is the enriching nature of such a vibrant and evolving uh, culture with so many wonderful things to do and see uh, that can't be uh, overlooked. With nearly 50 million, uh, 15 million visitors to Scotland in 2013, tourism remains uh, one of the largest and the fastest growing sectors of the economy. And while the majority of Scotland's tourists come from within the UK, I think our attractiveness to international visitors is very considerable and probably uh, on the way to increasing. In fact, the US 
uh, news channel CNN named Scotland as the number one destination for US tourists in 2013. And I think that was a, a very welcome accolade uh, for us as we uh, approach about Yes, indeed. Cabinet Secretary. Let's return from the US. Will she acknowledge that the showing of Outlander in the US will undoubtedly, I think, add to the impetus for US visitors to Scotland? Liz Smith. Cabinet Secretary, I couldn't possibly dispute that. And I hope you enjoyed your uh, time uh, across uh, the Atlantic. I think the reasons uh, behind uh, Scotland's international popularity are probably easy to understand. Uh, some say it's our long and exciting history of epic battles. Some say it's uh, our colourful historical personalities. Some are royal intrigues. But I think it's obviously very much our rich uh, culture and traditions that have helped shape the world uh, in almost every conceivable way. I think it was the uh, French philosopher Voltaire in the middle of the 18th century who captured that sentiment uh, famously when he noted that we look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization. From Scotland's scientists, inventors, architects, philosophers to its writers, its sports stars, musicians, artists of all sorts, our culture continues to exert a very marked influence uh, in the furthest corners of the globe. And then, of course, there are Scotland's events and attractions ranging from the world-class arts festivals that the Cabinet Secretary has described, our sporting events, our museums and galleries, to all sorts of uh, things that uh, take us to, as I say, every part of the world to attract our visitors. I think the economic benefits of uh, that tourism uh, are really striking. Figures uh, released by Visit Scotland highlight the fundamental importance of the growth in the tourist sector to Scottish economy in terms of uh, the job creation and the uh, economic growth as much as uh, £220 million just from golf tourism uh, alone. And Visit Scotland have estimated that in 2013 the visitor expenditure totaled nearly £5 billion. That is a very considerable uh, achievement and moreover that supports nearly uh, 300,000 jobs which equates uh, to almost 11% of the Scottish uh, workforce. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, last summer, whether it was the Commonwealth Games or the Ryder Cup, and I think we can all be uh, very proud uh, of uh, these events, but also uh, to congratulate all the people who took part and really put Scotland uh, on a very international stage. I think there will be uh, issues, obviously, uh, Claire Baker is quite right when she talks about the sustainability of some aspects of tourism, uh, and, and so on this point I want to come to my own amendment, where I think there is a very positive impact, obviously, uh, in our rural communities, uh, and that's something that I think um, brings a bit of a dilemma, uh, because uh, in terms of the number of jobs per head in the population, it's actually really quite high, but obviously uh, some of our rural areas uh, have difficulties with sustainability just now. Many have lost their uh, library or their local school or their police counter or uh, various other local services, the post shop or the local community, whatever it might be. And I think when you have uh, rural uh, festivals and rural uh, events, then obviously that is something that can help to bind that community together and to, to come up with the enrichment uh, of culture that I think the Cabinet Secretary spoke about uh, in her uh, introduction. Uh, and it's on that basis where I think there is potentially a dilemma if we obviously want to allow uh, people to access that as freely as possible, but to ensure that some of these uh, can uh, be sustained in the future, then obviously that does take uh, much greater uh, resource from the Scottish Government. Uh, and as we uh, want to be proud of the fact that demand is increasing and, and it's very healthy because it's become much more diverse, that is very good news. Uh, but the sustainability of these rural communities, I think, is something uh, that is part of our fabric and it's something that we have to look for uh, in uh, the future. So I think the economic benefits and the uh, social uh, enrichment of our culture is absolutely uh, clear, but perhaps even more importantly uh, is the, the way in which we can uh, envisage uh, society moving forward and, and passing on uh, a, a lot of the, um, the, the best assets of Scotland uh, to future uh, generations. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, if I can just finish, I think it was Winston Churchill who observed that perhaps only the ancient Greeks uh, surpassed the Scots in their contribution uh, to mankind and I think that makes us all feel immensely proud to be Scottish. This contribution to mankind stems from a deep cultural heritage from which so many superb visitor attractions and events have stemmed. And not only do these benefit us economically, but they enrich us as human beings in our societies, in our local communities. So it's on that basis uh, that I bring the amendment 
uh, to this chamber, um, but we're very happy, as I say, to support the government's motion and the Labour amendment. Many thanks. Could I ask members who hope to contribute to the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? We are very tight for time, so at this stage, speeches of six minutes, that may have to change. Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm sure that no one in this chamber underestimates the importance of Scottish culture to Scotland's economic well-being. For example, in 2011-12, there were 1,314,974 visitors to Edinburgh Castle alone. Now, Edinburgh Castle is historic Scotland's top visitor attraction. And while it's situated in the capital city, the economic benefits of visitors coming to Scotland to see the castle benefit the wider economy of our country. The benefits to all parts of our economy cannot be underestimated, and it's not just the capital or other big cities that benefit. In 2011-12, Scarabray, one of my favourite places to visit, was Historic Scotland's fourth most popular site, attracting some 68,852 visitors. Now, all of these visitors to Orkney needed transportation, accommodation, refreshments, and of course, they spent money and took back souvenirs of their visit. In the west of Scotland, Historic Scotland's most visited attraction is Dumbarton Castle, um, which is well worth a visit, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary can attest to that fact. In 2011-12, Dumbarton Castle attracted 14,623 visitors. It should attract many more visitors than that, as it is a fascinating place to visit and indeed a great stop-off on the way to Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. However, it's not just our interesting history which makes a contribution to our economy. In 2011, filming boosted Glasgow's economy to the tune of some £20 million. Now, I think we can all remember the transformation of George Square into a dramatic scene from World War Z. However, it's not just the big stars and big productions that are important. Smaller productions with only one or two two-day shoots contribute to the economy as well. The Edinburgh festivals made an economic impact of some £261 million for Scotland in 2012 and sustained 5,242 full-time jobs in Edinburgh alone. But it's easy to overlook the boost to the economy made by more recent and more youthful events. The Herald reported that a study at Tea in the Park in 2014 and that event showed that the economic impact on Scotland of the festival rose to almost £15.5 million. In Glasgow, the 2010 Celtic, Celtic Connections, a festival which only started in 1994, generated over £10 million to the city and some £12 million to the wider Scottish economy. So innovation and introducing modern showcases for Scotland's cultural heritage, a heritage that has gone around the world with Scottish immigrants, has proved popular and successful. Our economy is boosted not just from within, but from without, because Scotland has a strong brand which is recognised and admired the world over. For example, Visit Scotland noted that after the Disney film Brave was released, attractions such as Dunotter Castle, the inspiration for Dunrock Castle in the film, and the Callanish Standing Stones both reported significant increases in visitors in the summer of 2013, of circa 16% and 10% respectively, with an interest in Brave as a principal reason behind the rise in visitor numbers. Now, there is no doubt that our culture boosts our economy and creates jobs. So in that particular sense, our culture is good for our country. But I believe that our vibrant cultural scene is good for Scotland and for everyone who lives here in a much wider and more profound sense. A Norwegian study published in the Journal of Epidemi Epidemi I knew I'd fall over this word, Epidemiology and Community Health and reported in the Telegraph, and no, I'm not going to say it again, no, on the 23rd of May 2011, found that simply observing culture improves the physical health and mental well-being of men. The Telegraph reported that results showed that in men, all receptive cultural activities were linked to better health. The academics concluded that this population-based study supports gender-dependent associations between cultural participation and physical health, anxiety, depression and satisfaction with life. Now, in Scotland in 2013, there were sadly 795 suicides, of which 611, or nearly 77%, were men. Culture is life-enhancing, and men stand to benefit enormously from cultural participation. In an article in the Canadian Journal of Communication in 2006, there was a report of the findings of a workshop of experts who had met to discuss the question, what are the social effects of participation in arts and heritage? The participations at that workshop identified six social effects of culture, arts and heritage, among which were the findings that culture builds social cohesion and increased citizenship capacity. Social cohesion was defined as the willingness of people in a society to cooperate with each other in common enterprises to achieve collective goals. The report also stated that 
Increased civic participation is a consequence of a dynamic and diverse cultural scene in the community. Given all of the above, I was pleased to note that the Scottish Household Survey 2013 already mentioned said that 91% of adults engaged in culture of some sort and that 80% of adults had attended a cultural event or a place of culture and 78% had participated in a cultural activity in the previous 12 months. Sadly, however, there is still a divide in Scotland in terms of participation by deprivation, just as there is with education, health, longevity and every other indicator. The Scottish Household Survey found 33% of people in Scotland's most deprived areas were more likely to agree that culture and the arts are not really for people like me, compared to only 16% in the least deprived areas. It is now a well-known fact that social inequalities and deprivation lead to poorer outcomes for all aspects of people's lives. Successive Scottish governments have worked hard to counter the effects of deprivation on the lives of the poorest people in Scotland. Have a Heart Paisley, the Cranhill Community Project, Child Smile, the Nursery Toothbrushing Project, which has proved extremely successful. Or just Again, a few examples close, of the efforts that have been made. However, it seems to me that there is a case to be made for building culture into the strategies for improving Scotland's health, both physical and mental. In conclusion, presiding officer, perhaps when the Scottish Government Ministerial Task Force on Health Inequalities next sits, it will take into account the tremendous impact for good that culture has, and that it makes some attempt to build increased access to cultural events and cultural participation into its considerations on the best way of improving the lives of the people of Scotland. Thank you. I'm afraid I need to make it clear to the Chamber there is absolutely no time in this debate, so members must stop before six minutes. Please, Hans Alam Malik, to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank Fiona Hessler for this motion today and Claire Baker for her amendment. Scotland, regardless of its constitutional status, it is a proud nation. Our unique culture makes Scotland unlike any other place in the world. Clear evidence for this provision this year only proves that Scotland's culture identity is valid, valuable, not only to our society, but to our economy as well. We as a nation have much to offer the world as seen in last year's impressive increase in tourism. The interna internationalization rep repetition of Scotland can be immediately beneficial for our economy growth as well. With 12 international world famous festivals, Scotland has a platform for continuing this with the rest of the world. With bigger money, resources, and the brand that can prove to be invaluable for Scotland. From a personal experience, I have seen the effects that the latest Commonwealth Games had on the city of Glasgow. Millions of pounds re-aggravated the city Clyde waterside front as much as the east end of Glasgow. The Games were not only about sports, however. The cultural events of the Commonwealth Games festivals were amazing, amazingly successful and brought crowds and recognition to Glasgow as well as the rest of Scotland. In terms of a legacy, these events have proven not only for temporary benefit, but for substance, substantially long-term promise. I join many of my MSPs in welcoming these promising results, but I urge the Scottish Government to not allow complacency. The international recognition we seek is not inherited, but must be earned and nurtured. We in Scotland must always keep our culture close when we share it with the world. Amazing things happen. Let's continue to foster our identity so that we can share it with more and more people around the world. This means continuing funding for festivals and uh, broadening of our international awareness and always improving branding our nation to the outside world. Let us give, let me give an example. I believe that the Glasgow Mela should be under the Scottish Government funding pool. 
such an important event should be under a national banner. I know the Glasgow City Council would not want to give up such a successful event, which started by small events around the city, culminating and coming together to one to two days and now a three days successful event. This is its 25th anniversary, and I call upon the Scottish Government to play its role and ensure that this Mela is not only a successful event this year to celebrate its 21st anniversary, but also continues to be on the Scottish agenda and calendar. But I also believe that multiculturalism events such as the Glasgow Mela need that recognition. Um, so I look forward to Fiona Haslop's comments to draw up a list of perhaps events such as these which will culminate in developing ideas so that we can represent all our communities in Scotland. I have to say that up until quite recently, um, the focus seems to have been taken off in terms of what the minority communities that make up our culture and history have been let down. And I think that organizations like the Edinburgh Mela and the Glasgow Mela go a long way in trying to support and rekindle that activity. I know for a fact, as a local councillor of Glasgow for 17 years, that it took a lot of time, effort, energy, and dedication by a very few number of people to establish the Mela of Glasgow, to see it to become a successful event in Scotland. The participants come not only from all over Scotland, not only from all over the, the United Kingdom, but in fact internationally. Final and, minute. And that makes me really proud because when we celebrate the Mela in Glasgow, it is not only about the minority community, it is about the minority community engaging with the rest of the communities in Scotland, but also at the same time selling the brand of Scotland around the world, something that me as a Glaswegian, I am very proud of. Therefore, I call upon the Scottish Government to look at some of these minority organizations who bring so much to our culture and diversity that uh, we can be proud of. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And to now call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Mark Griffin. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I'm, I'm probably very lucky in terms of the constituency I represent in Aberdeenshire West. And it will come as no surprise, I'm sure, to the Cabinet Secretary when I mention Huntley. Huntley in itself, they say the town is the place. And that is because they engage with their community. They take arts to the community, whether it be walking, whether it be painting, whether it be just an engagement with local sort of folk music and dance. Presenting officer, but that's only a story in one area, because Deborah and Arts promote that within the Huntley area. But within my constituency, I have 12 castles. I haven't been to them, all of them, but I can assure you that... Well, not yet, but, but I've been to the 12 castles. And, and again, we've got one palace, that is in Balmoral. So I suppose really, you know, does my constituency sell itself? In some ways it does, because people come back to that constituency because of our clan origins. For instance, the other week I was in Fingen. Again, I name I love seeing within this chamber, presiding officer. But when I was in the Fingen estate, I was reminded that the Farkersons have only been there 400 years. And I was told that perhaps they could soon become local. But there again, you see, within that estate, what I found was it's a breeding place for the Capricale. And what I was, what I was immensely proud of was the community spirit that was within that area. Because within the community hall, they bring people together, whether it's the older people or the younger people. And we see the young and the old mixing well, whether it's in uh, putting on performances to raise money for the estate, whether it's to put on performances or to just have uh, exploration within some of the fine woodlands we have in those areas. They develop their own community spirit. And when Liz Smith mentioned the rural areas of Scotland and how perhaps there was maybe in danger of, of maybe missing out to some extent, I actually say the opposite. Our rural areas are thriving in some areas. But I was looking at Logie Colstone in my own constituency as well. That is a community that has embraced each other. 
They, have, they work with their local school. They work with the young. They look at their history and their culture. And all the time within these rural communities, you're seeing this whole sense of well-being. And this is really important. Yeah. Liz Smith. For forgiving way, I, I don't deny that some uh, rural communities are doing an absolutely fantastic job. In others, however, it is much more difficult, uh, not least because the sustainability of some of the other services in these areas uh, has been threatened, and therefore that's more difficult, and that's where I think the support needs to be uh, put. Dennis Robertson. Uh, and I fully appreciate and understand what the member is saying, but in the examples I'm giving, presiding officer, they have not seen this as a barrier. They have seen is this as a challenge, a challenge and an opportunity to embrace and to see how they can move forward within their own communities with using the limited resources within those communities themselves. Not looking at whether it be the local council or the government, but they're saying, what can we do to embrace our own heritage within our own uh, communities? And I think we should, we should encourage mo uh, more of that within our communities, presiding officer. Within, again, you know, I, I talk about uh, Aberdeenshire West with, with great pride. And because when it comes to health and well-being, many of our small towns and villages are actually doing things. They're going out, they're walking, they're exploring their heritage. They're actually putting together within their own communities during the winter, people to come and relate about the past, to talk about the poetry, to engage in the folk mu music and folk law, which is exciting for many of our people, especially those within the Alzheimer groups, who are given the opportunity, provided that opportunity, to embrace their past and talk about it with passion and indeed happiness. Presiding officer, we have the men's shed in West Hill. And again, bringing together men who can actually relate again to some of their older industries, what they've done is they've restored steam engines. They look at old tools. They actually find from their community, what is it we can do for your community? But what it does do is it allows a group of men to sit down together and talk quite fondly, I think, about the past. Maybe not in the too distant past, but when you hear some of the stories, I do wonder. Presiding officer, I'm very fortunate that I've been to many of these places within my constituency. And recently, I met with Paul Anderson, one of the world-renowned fiddlers within, uh, within Scotland. Final and, minute. And Paul, Paul graciously wrote a tune called Mr Q. Presiding officer, again, this is to show that within the communities, within the communities, you've got your young people coming forward and learning about the, the older traditions, the music that keeps us alive. That expectation is there, presiding officer. We get the tourism coming to or my constituency. We have distilleries, Loch Nagar. We've got the palace at Balmoral. We have the fishing. But, presiding officer, this needs to, the sustainable aspect of fishing means that if the tourists come, the fish need to be there. And this is something perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can speak with her other ministers about. And in conclusion, presiding officer, isn't it nice to be the MSP for Aberdeenshire West? <laughs> Thank you very much. And I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer, and I too welcome the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate on Scotland's culture and the benefits that it brings to our economy and wider Scottish society. Like members across this chamber, I'm proud to be Scottish, proud of our history, our culture, our heritage, and proud of what we've achieved and continue to achieve as a nation. It's been from Robert Burns um, to Disney's Brave, has been mentioned before, from whiskey to Stornoway Black Pudding, from the Highland Games to golf at St Andrews, from Tartan Week in the United States to the Tartan Army travelling the globe and every once in a while being left disappointed. Scotland's culture, our heritage and our people make us all proud to be Scots and tremendous ambassadors. Scotland attracts millions of domestic and overseas vis visitors every year, with over 12 million attending Scotland's tourist attractions last year. Many of those attractions seen a 10% increase on 2013. And of course, the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup played an important role in attracting visitors to our shore, and the benefits to our economy um, were clear. 
I was delighted that Strathclyde Country Park in my region hosted the first competitive event of the Commonwealth Games, the, the triathlon, with thousands of athletes and visitors from across the globe making their way to North Lanarkshire. In addition to that, the cycling time trial took place along the A80 corridor, showcasing the villages in Muirhead and the Middlesbrough area too. The legacy of the Games was almost, always of utmost importance, and it's excellent to see that over 3,000 Commonwealth apprenticeships have been secured, over £198 million spent on new and improved sport facilities alone, and over £145 million in conference and events secured in Glasgow and the wider area due to having host city status. All of that has contributed massively to Scotland's economy and the attractiveness um, of the country and, and visitors coming to see our sites. But there can be no doubt that the talents of the people of Scotland have strengthened our Scottish culture from Edwin Morgan's fascinating sonnets of Scotland to the bizarre imaginative world, world of Ian Banks, the Wasp Factory, and the humour and desperation of Irvin Welsh's train spotting. Scotland's literally, literary leaders have helped take Scotland to the world. Similarly, we have artists like Andy Scott, whose now world-famous sculptures are attracting thousands of people's, people to lo locations across my region in central Scotland. We have our thousands of talented actors, directors and producers who are entertaining audiences here and across the globe. We also have the benefit here in Scotland of so many excellent visitor attractions from Edinburgh Castle here in the east to the more modern Glasgow Science Centre in the west, across the length and breadth of Scotland, local, um, local and, and for, foreign visitors alike flocked to these attractions. I'm delighted and delighted that in my area of Cumbernauld we have the fantastic Palace Rig Country Park. That was established in the early 1970s. Palace Rig has developed into a hub of conservation, countryside recreation and environmental education. In more than 40 hectares of land has been transformed over the years from farmland with hundreds of thousands of native trees and shrubs being planted. And Palace Rig um, is also home to a unique rare breed collection including Eriskay ponies, Tamworth pigs and Scots dumpy poultry amongst other um, an extensive collection of, of rare farm animals and that collection the wider natural beauty of Palace Rig attracts thousands of people free of charge every year and not too far from Palace Rig is Summer Lee, Scotland's leading industrial heritage museum um, set around the 19th century. Summer Lee Ironworks in Coke Bridge. The museum has many attractions, including Scotland's only operational heritage tramway and a recreated mine, along with the, the miners' cottages. Again, that's open all year round and free to visit. Central Scotland has excellent cultural venues which attract local people and international visitors year on year and contribute greatly to Scottish society and our wider economy and that's replicated right across Scotland. With the success of international events like the Commonwealth Games and its legacy, with UK wide events such as the British Transplant Games which will be hosted by North Lanarkshire in 2017, international venues like the Hydro attracting world famous performers. Scotland's natural beauty and historical sites as well as our food, our drink if and most importantly up, our people. I'm confident that Scotland will continue to welcome the world to our shores and enhance our international reputation. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Christine Allard. Up to six minutes please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I say to Dennis Robertson, just you forget Aberdeenshire West and welcome to Midlothian South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale because the next train leaving Edinburgh Waverley is the train for the borders, calling at Newton Grange, Gorebridge, Stow, Gallashields and Tweedbank. 
The date is the 6th of September 2015. It will be less than £10 end to end. Arrival at final destination in 55 minutes on peak every half hour off peak hourly. First train, if you're up with the Lark, is at 5.20am from Tweed Bank. But you can get the last train back, remember, at 11.54, not a minute later. We've come a long way in 16 years from the campaign for Borders Rail, the petition to this parliament in 1999, the cross-party group on Border Rail, and the 2nd of June 2000, when the parliament voted to restore that line. It's on budget and on time. This is the most significant economic development in decades for Midlothian and the Scottish borders, not just for commuters, but to open up the entire area to a substantial increase in tourism. There's plenty to see, such as the Mining Museum at Scotland, housed in the restored Lady Victoria Colliery, Newton Grange, already predicted to be hitting 63,000 plus visitors this year, celebrating 30 years, and indeed the only Scottish visitor attraction to have won Best Visitor Award currently graded as a five-star attraction. There's also the purpose-built mining village around Newton Grange, with rows of identical cottages on 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, 4th Street, and so on. It's not easy to get lost. And finally, on, in Newton Grange, on the opening of the railway, they've got together with Visit Scotland, with Lothian Council and the Tourism Forum there to create tourism packages, joint ticketing, and special events. So you can see by their example how the opportunities are opening up with that line. At Tweed Bank, there is proposed a customised building for the Great Tapestry of Scotland. Not my choice of location, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is where I get controversial. I think it was the trustees who decided to put on a business park. A mystery to me why you put a tourist attraction on a business park. And even more worrying is the leader of the council's comment when he says, and this is costing millions, what we've done is designed the building very carefully so that it's a multi-purpose building. So in years to come, if the tapestry didn't work, then we could do something in the building and still get a return for the public purse. Hardly an optimistic proposal. So at Tweed Bank, we have that. I think it should have been in Gala Shields. A stone's throw away from Tweed Bank is Abbotsford with the eclectic home of Sir Walter Scott. Restored now, absolutely wonderful place. The gardens have been restored and the rather splendid visitor centre, all part funded and supported by this government, over 40,000 visitors last year. But there are other parts that the train won't reach. And the plan is to use the line beyond its tracks and extend that borders and Midlothian experience. And I welcome support the Conservative Amendment, which I think is very important about how local festivals, local issues bring so much to the economy. And in fact, it marries well with the Labour Amendment about the role of volunteers who in fact keep these festivals going. We had the Melrose Sevens recently. That brought two million into that economy in Melrose and area. There's a Tweed Love two-week bike festi biking events festival, the biggest bike festival, I managed to say bike, uh, over 40 different bike events in the Tweed Valley. That's 100% organised by the volunteers themselves who give it their all. The Chaquare Fair in August, held in the grounds of the oldest continuously inhabited house in Scotland by the Maxwell Stewarts. It's an excellent festival with speeches and books. And of course, they've got their own brew of beer. You can't take it now because we've got higher tests now uh, if you're driving. But if you're able to take it and get the bus, then you can get the bus to the train and get the train back to Edinburgh. And throughout the summer months, all the ridings and local festivals, the Brawl Lads and Lasses of Gala, the Beltane at Peebles, the Whitmans at West Linton, the Pennycook Hunter, Lad and Lass. And at that time of the year, all these places have different colours with the bunting that they've strewn over their streets and hang from the windows and their houses and so on, where local people make it so jolly and attractive and exciting, and it brings business to the communities. But back to that railway and the opportunities to bring international visitors to Midlothian and the borders away from the overheated, overpriced city of Edinburgh during the festival. Think of that late night train. You can stay in the borders in Midlothian at half the price of staying in the city of Edinburgh, go to a show, get on the train, get back get up in the morning to lovely scenery. I think I should get commissioned for this. If I sound excited about the railway line, well, I am. And I hope that there'll be a seat in that train for me. And if you're really nice to me, Mr Robertson, I'll have one for you and Mr Q. Many thanks. I'll call on Christian Allard to be followed by Neil Finlay.
Thank you very much, President the Officer. And I shall, like my colleague Dennis Robertson, go back to the area where everything takes place, the so northeast of Scotland and Aberdeenshire, of course. Uh, the contribution of culture, the visitor attraction and even to Scotland economy and society is great in the northeast of Scotland. I, I do agree that the festival 2014 was a huge success and the Glasgow Cultural Programme was the most ambitious national culture celebration to take place in Scotland. But Scotland's historic, historic environment is a vital resource in cultural, social and economic terms which can and should deliver greater benefits to all communities and particularly the communities that I represent in the northeast of Scotland. One which is very well known, the Port Soy, uh, at Port Soy, the Port Soy Ball Festival is taking place on the 4th and the 5th of July which, commemorate, which celebrate the year of food and drink this year, a uh, very important year, and we will celebrate uh, Scotland's fantastic natural larder and exceptional natural produce as well as the landscape. But more importantly uh, to this debate as, as well to, about culture, we will be celebrating the people and culture that make our food heritage so unique. And Stuart Maxwell talked about uh, the brand, Scotland's brand, and I think uh, it's so unique that we've got that food linked to our culture, would make makes it uh, uh, such a part of our economic growth. Our economic growth locally is closely linked with the celebration of this culture. Uh, the 2015 festival promised a program packed with music, song and dance, and children's entertainment. It's a grand day out for all the family. Uh, this year, uh, Friday's showcase concert, which started with the Banff Academy's traditional band led by Sharon Hassan. We know Sharon Hassan when she came here with the Northeast Folk Collective, uh, Sharon is very much empowering young people through the learning of Scottish uh, traditional music. Very much in the footstep of our Tal and Phil Paul Anderson, by my colleague Dennis Robertson talked about earlier. And uh, since its formation in 2009, the Office Folk Collective have performed on a number of festivals and venues, not, through, not only throughout the UK, but as well as far as in Derry. Uh, uh, in the, and, and, and of course, back to the to, to the northeast in the Stonehaven Folk Festival, uh, Scottish people place is a great value and culture and heritage. And I will know that uh, I, I was part of a, of a ski, of an heritage society, my local skin heritage society, uh, which is uh, uh, very much open to everybody, uh, because you don't need to be born here to enjoy uh, our culture, or become a guardian of our heritage. And those local groups are fantastic. They are full of local volunteers, and we're sharing our culture and our heritage. Uh, the Skin Heritage Society will be uh, uh, at the 12th uh, BA Vintage Country Fair to be held of the weekend of 16th or 17th of May in Linoskill. As you can see, I can find uh, uh, plenty to do for all the members uh, during the summer. And in June, at the Bonaco Steam Held uh, Festival, uh, held at Castle Fraser. Uh, the Scottish Household Survey that some members talked about uh, found that 89% of adults agree with the following. It is important to me that heritage buildings and places are well looked after. In Aberdeen, we have Marshall College, the new headquarters of Aberdeen City Council, that have quickly became a, a fantastic tourist, tourist attraction. In May 2011, the sculpture of King Robert Bruce uh, that measure 18 feet uh, high was unveiled outside Marshall College. Uh, this statue, uh, created by the sculpture Alan Beatty Elliott, was commissioned following a motion by Councillor, uh, then Councillor Kevin Stewart, now MSP for Aberdeen Central. And it's so important that we've got that political will to recognize this. Uh, the sculpture now is a very much the iconic piece of the city and is cherished by all Aberdonians and unmarked by all visitors to the city. It has become a magnet uh, for, for tourists. As a Scottish household survey found that 72% 72, 72 of people agreed that the heritage in the local area is well looked after. Unfortunately, the current administration of Aberdeen City uh, are not getting it right yet. The survey is telling us as well that 57% of the population agrees that there are lots of opportunities to get involved in culture and the art. And the Scottish government uh, is uh, uh, pro providing funding for system as the Scotland's big noise orchestra. And of course, we are in Aberdeen. Uh, we have now with Tory as uh, a big noise story, uh, which will be officially launched uh, with the first community concern at the end of the term in June uh, in Aberdeen. And it's very much thriving in the office of Scotland. And the aim uh, is that 
or uh, uh, children, as their children will grow up, they'll do better in school, they'll be healthier, happier, and their lives will have been transformed by being involved in, in music. Uh, and what is important, uh, presiding officer, is to understand how much all these activities are really contributing to, uh, to, to our society and contributing to the economic growth of, 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 of our areas in the northeast of Scotland. And one that Dennis Robertson didn't talk about was, of course, uh, the wooden barn in Bankery, which is a fantastic uh, a creative hub welcoming all and a great asset to the northeast. And it's no surprise to me that Creative Scotland has shortlisted Bankery as one of the committees to win £125,000 as a creative place award 2015. Uh, what I will say in conclusion, President Officer, is that uh, in the, this new project of uh, Aberdeen City Region project, uh, it's very, very important that culture and the arts are not forgotten because it's very important but are very much part of the growth of the North East of Scotland. What I would say to the Scottish Government and to everybody involved, the two local authorities, do not forget art and culture when you talk about the City Region Project. Presenting Officer. Many thanks. Thank you. And I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by John Mason. Thanks, President Officer. Many people have referred to the rich and diverse uh, uh, cultural landscape that there is across Scotland and across the arts the, and the music scene and sport, we see exciting developments taking place. But, of course, as a visitor or a spectator or a participant in any of these cultural activities, our enjoyment, our enjoyment of them is determined not just by the uh, talent and the ability of performers and artists and the sporting stars, but also often uh, the unseen contribution of staff who make these great events uh, happen, the organisers, the administrators, fundraisers, committee men and women, trustees, security staff, etc. They all play a, a huge role in ensuring that events happen and that people are safe and can enjoy all uh, that is on offer. So, with this in mind, I want to, as uh, Chair of the Public and Commer Commercial Services Union Parliamentary Group, raise the issue that I mentioned when I intervened in the Cabinet Secretary, and that's the long-running dispute at our National Museum, the National Museum of Scotland. Last week, Thursday and Friday, PCS staff there walked out, uh, resulting in the closure of what should be a place of huge national pride, a place that is our most visited attraction. Almost 1.7 million people going through the doors each year. That success was achieved because of the staff who work there. Yet the lowest paid members of that staff team see their wages and conditions under attack. The museum management, with, I presume, the then Cabinet Secretary's approval, broke an existing ACAS agreement to impose a two-tier system on the museum staff. So any member of staff employed since 1st of January 2011 and who works weekends as part of their duties no longer receives a weekend allowance. Those working prior to that date do. And this allowance was previously negotiated and agreed to recognise that working weekends, when children are off school or family members off work, and when people want to visit, visit uh, uh, tourist attractions like the museum, impacts on people uh, on their family uh, and on their family life. And that anti-social element of their shift rota was recognised in their pay. So what we now have is two low-paid workers on the same shift, doing the same job for the same employer, but one being paid much less than his or her colleague. And it's not a small amount of money. It's up to 20% of their salary, up to £3,000 a year in hard cash, £3,000 from someone who only earns £18,000 and lives in the expensive city that Christine Graham mentioned. That's a very significant amount of money. Maybe not for the chief executive, of course, who earns over £110,000, but most certainly for the low-paid staff who run the place, some of whom take home less than a thousand, almost less than a thousand pound a month, while well, the chief executive takes home nearer two thousand pounds a week. And what about the government's role in this? Well, the responsibility for resolving this year and a half long dispute lies fairly and squarely with the cabinet secretary, who, as far as I can see, has done zero in an attempt to bring this to an end. Only two weeks ago, her colleague John Swinney said, and I quote, Fair work will play a key role in making Scotland the fairer and more equal society everyone wants to see. Which is why it is a principle which the SNP will be putting at the heart of our election campaign 
over the next four weeks. How does that square? Just a moment. How does that statement square with ripping off these staff to the tune of £3,000 a year? Fiona Hislop. The, would the member confirm that no one at the National Museum has actually had their take-home pay cut? Would he also confirm that the National Museum of Wales is actually planning to take away the weekend allowance from existing staff, which is not the case in Scotland? And would he further confirm that uh, seven-day working in the tourism and uh, heritage sector is the norm and that the following organisations do not play weekend working allowances? Historic Scotland National Trust, Visit Scotland, Dynamic Heritage Museum. That's enough. Responsible. Vina, You're responsible Kate, for culture in Scotland, not Wales. So take your responsibilities seriously. And if seven-day working is the norm, let's have a race to the top on terms and conditions, not a race to the bottom like you want. So why is it that the government, eh, in a desperate bid to prevent strikes in the prison service in the run-up to the UK and Scottish elections, can find money to give prison officers £2,000 e each? And let me say good luck to the Prison Officers Association for negotiating an, uh, negotiating an increase. But they can't find the cash to pay the museum staff what they deserve. The Cabinet Secretary can't blame anyone else for this. No amount of deflection will work this time. None of the usual bogeymen can be rolled out as part of another diversionary tactic. Because it's not the UK Government's fault. It's not the Labour Party's fault. It's not any Labour Council's fault. It's not European law. It's not even the lack of powers. So all the old chestnuts cannot be rolled out. It's simply the Cabinet Secretary's lack of political will and desperately poor leadership. She and the museum management could sort this out for £200,000, a tiny proportion of the £414 million underspend that our government has, and yet she sat by for 18 months and done nothing. Once again, the course, government please. have been found out, as they have been on so many other things when it comes to people in the workplace. Many thanks. Now call on John Mason to be followed by Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And as we've just heard, this is obviously a wide-ranging debate and uh, covers a lot of issues. Uh, while culture is the first uh, key word in the title of the debate, uh, visit attractions and events uh, make it even wider. Now, sport is not specifically mentioned in the title, uh, but the Commonwealth Games are mentioned in the motion, and events presumably includes all events with sport in there too. Events like the Commonwealth Games clearly attract visitors in the year that they actually happen. And the same is true for the cultural events surrounding the Games, which happened in 2014. However, the other side of the coin is that they raise the profile of the host city and country. And while some people do not actually come in the particular year eh, of the event, they do come later on. I guess that is harder to measure and pin down exactly why visitors have come to Glasgow or Scotland in a particular year. But the fact it is harder to measure does not mean it is less important. Venues built for the Commonwealth Games continue to hold events which should encourage visitors, eh, for example, to watch Scotland's only professional basketball team, Glasgow Rocks, at the Emirates Arena. Cycling, swimming, hockey all now have world-class facilities, eh, so we can look forward to regularly holding major events in the future, not least eh, Glasgow co-hosting the first European Sports Championships with Berlin in 2018. Now, culture clearly includes a uh, Scottish culture in all its various forms, and I absolutely want to see us unashamedly celebrating Scottish culture, be it Burns, bagpipes, or Scottish films, like one of my favourites from a few years ago, Shallow Grave, which I think was one of the first Scottish films I saw with no cringe factor. But Scotland has become increasingly diverse and international, as Hans Le Malik uh, was reminding us, and I think we both uh, need to, and in fact should, want to celebrate other cultures which have found a home here in Scotland. Now, for me, in the east end of Glasgow, that certainly includes Irish culture, and that clearly includes Celtic Football Club. Uh, to say that Celtic is just a football team is to miss a lot of points. Uh, culture and sport here very much overlap. Both Hibs in Edinburgh and Celtic in Glasgow grew out of the Irish experience in Scotland. And I think we all need to be a bit more relaxed about that and welcome it. Visitors to all European cities want to see sports stadia as part of their city experience, and I'm not sure we have fully tapped into that potential in Glasgow. Now, I see Scotland and our culture largely as part of the Celtic family of nations, and I would like to see that traditional link strengthened. Celtic Connections has been a huge success 
in more ways than one and has helped us draw, uh, helped, helped us draw together the many strands of our Celtic heritage. The main venue for Celtic connections in my constituency is St Andrews in the Square, which is now the centre for traditional Scottish music, song and dance. If MSPs have never visited the building itself, I certainly would encourage you uh, to do so. It really is a superb building and was in fact being built when Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, visited the city. Uh, this year, I think I was at three different events all there and particularly enjoyed uh, St Roque's Cayley Band, uh, which is clearly coming from an Irish uh, background. There are many ways in which we can seek to tackle uh, serious subjects like sectarianism and anti-Irish racism, and I think cultural events like music are some of the best. This evening, too, I understand Joe McAlpin is hosting an anti-sectarian play called Freedom Square from Ryan Youth Theatre, and again, that is very welcome. I'm looking forward to being at that. Often theatre and music can help us think through issues at a deeper level, which is harder to do in a debate even in this place or on social media. As the Labour Amendment says, culture can contribute towards improving learning, health, well-being, confidence and quality of life, and I would want to echo that. On the international stage, in my constituency, we have the World Pipe Band Championships at Glasgow Green, which has been held in the city every year since 1986, with some 7,000 musicians and an audience of some 30,000, and it is reckoned to generate perhaps £10 million for the local economy. Now, Glasgow Green, as members probably know, is just east of the city centre, eh, as is St Andrews in the Square, and I also have a palace, eh, slightly different from Dennis Robertson's one, and it is called the People's Palace. Eh, and that is close by to the Merchant City, which has been a huge success in many ways, but also it's close by to areas that have been struggling, like the Barras, Calton, Brigton and Dalmarnock. The Barras Market, in particular, was a major visitor attraction in the past, that has struggled in recent times, and we not, do not seem to have been able to help it fulfil its potential in the way that perhaps markets in other cities have managed. All of this brings home to me in a particularly clear way how culture, visitor attractions and events can play a key role in boosting the economy and regeneration, but that does not mean it is all plain sailing or there is an easy fix. All of that area eh, around Glasgow Green still faces big challenges and things take time. The merchant city regeneration has not spread east as rapidly as many of us might have hoped. Draw to a close, please. Now, I realise I have been very focused on my own constituency, so let me finish by mentioning a few things further away. Uh, the Edinburgh Festival is a fabulous event, 40 miles from Glasgow, and yet with traditionally very few Glaswegians actually attending. There have been moves in that regard, but I think we need to try and do more. And finally, another example is folk from the central belt not uh, travelling north. For example, I meet many people in Glasgow who have never been to Inverness, let alone to the islands. So I do think we need to put more emphasis on getting our own people to visit our own attractions. Thank you. Hey, thanks. I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I commend Stuart Maxwell on his speech? Uh, she's, he's not in the Chamber of President, but uh, on, on inequalities, and I want to actually focus on that issue. El Sistema involves half a million children across Venezuela it has produced some of the finest classical musicians in the world, but behind these musical achievements is an even more exciting story. Because El Sistema uses the symphony orchestra to benefit society, it not only produces musicians, but happy and well-equipped citizens, often from the poorest and most vulnerable backgrounds. And now, visitors to Raploch in Stirling will often be met by a small voice asking, what do you play? The children here just assume that everyone has an instrument that everyone plays something. Raplock is the home to UK's first flowering of the remarkable El Sistema movement. The development was seen as an integral to the environmental improvements in the Raplock and Stirling, which the Labour Council has fostered over many years. Yes. Neil Finlay. Um, I uh, had the pleasure of uh, being in the Caracas, Caracas uh, Opera House to see El Sistema a few years back when I was a, on a deputation over there. Um, I would strongly encourage them to go to see where it originated because it was absolutely amazing. Richard Simpson. That's something I may do when I retire, Neil. I will, Mr Finlay, I will, I will hope to uh, as a place to visit. But the Rapport Center is quite a tiny place. Uh, and there are over 450 children from babes in arms through to 14-year-olds involved in the big noise the orchestra programme launched in 2008. 75% of primary school children in the estate are involved at any given time. 
And the big orchestra will grow with this new generation through to adulthood. And all this just in a couple of square miles tucked into a meander on the River Forth. Once this area was lumbered with a very negative in image, the community is now becoming famous for its young maestros instead. And more than that, these children have become role models and this community has become an inspiration. Govan Hill is now copying them. Now, although not an ex inexpensive option, it can improve the health and well-being, the aspiration and achievement in a way that no previous program has done. In my view, it fulfills in, in, through art many of the principles of the, the policy embodied in Sir John Elvidge's papers for the Carnegie Trust entitled The Enabled, Made an Enabling State, which I've recommended to colleagues before and I do have no hesitation in recommending again. It is about doing things with communities and meeting their aspirations. However, we are faced with a situation in which musical, musical instrument education is under great pressure and is one of the potential longer term cuts dam the damages of the cuts. The government's role is traditionally seen as funding the big events like the Commonwealth Games, and these are certainly important for our brand on the world stage. But working with communities and supporting those programs which the community itself supports demonstrates a much better approach. I want to give three further examples in different areas. Firstly, spinning out from the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, of which I've been a supporter for 20 years, has been the East Nuke Festival, unique because it uh, has a level, high level of private sponsorship, but secondly, for its use of multiple local venues, mainly churches. But the level of private sponsorship is something I believe we should recognize and complement. Communities should be encouraged to, to, to help fund themselves. I also commend a paper by Lynette uh, looking at a project supported by Creative Scotland involving five national organizations working with offenders. There are clear findings from research from North Africa, New Zealand, and the UK that arts participation can encourage the development of better relationships between prisoners, better relationships with prison staff, better relationships between the offenders and their families. Participating in arts projects often improves self-esteem and self-confidence. It helps communication and social skills. It enables people to work together and help each other as peers and results in prisoners taking part in other education courses after completing an arts project. The finding of the Creative Scotland sponsored paper uh, makes it clear that international research, which I've mentioned, is replicated in this. And it works when traditional pedagogy has failed. This culture-based approach has much to commend it. Central Artlink, for example, based in Stirling, has made effective contributions to Corton Vale and H.M. Polman, again engaging young men who would otherwise not engage. In 2001, so I would highly recommend to the, Justice, to the Culture Secretary, she talks to Justice and to Health about continuing and supporting these projects. I'll finish, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, by One just minute. saying that in 2001 as Justice Minister, I was very happy to support the business plan from the Registrar General to integrate the register of births, deaths mar and marriages and the CACIN register. I supported this at the time because I believed that genealogy would become much more important. The modest investment that we made has paid off in substantial growth of genealogical tourism. Colleagues, we have 60 million plus of diaspora. I believe that we need a more comprehensive and integrated approach beyond the homecomings to encourage even greater growth in this form of tourism. And I hope the government are indeed ready to do this. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart Stevenson, followed by Jean Urquhart. Fit light loon, chavin doon, far ye ging, aft to sing. Foos to hear, a foos air, fans the tour. AC a glower. Now that's my imperfect attempt at poetry, which has not been uh, something that we've heard anything of in the debate thus far. And of course, it's poetry that uses the language of the Northeast, the Doric. And poetry is, of course, something for which Scotland is known the worldwide through the great poems of Robert Burns. We see outside the Canongate Kirk. Uh, a nice new statue to Robert Ferguson, who was the uh, fellow that Robert Burns wrote uh, a post-mortem obituary for, for, 
referring to Robert Ferguson as his elder brother in the Muse. And we see tourists being photographed alongside uh, the statue of Robert Ferguson without, I suspect, any great sense of who Robert Ferguson was, apart from, as it says uh, beneath, uh, someone who died uh, in Bedlam, uh, which, of course, was not the best place to die if you were going to die in Edinburgh. So we have a cultural heritage. I will, yes, ma'am. Um, I thank him for raising the issue of Robert Ferguson. Does he agree with me that perhaps the poet would be better known amongst Scots if the National Portrait Gallery hadn't hidden away his portrait in the vaults instead of putting it on permanent display? An answer is a poet, Mr Stevenson. I, I, I find extemporising with poetry even more fundamentally difficult than putting words on a bit of paper. So I will resist that temptation, if I may. Um, what I've just heard is uh, news to me, and I, I'm minded to agree uh, with what the member says. But certainly, words, literature, uh, poetry are an important part of our connection with the world and our gift to the world. Uh, we are fortunate that our neighbours to the south of us in this island have given us one of the richest languages on this earth in English with a huge vocabulary and a huge opportunity uh, to write uh, and many things for us to lead, uh, read. So I hope that that becomes an important part of what we do. The Wigton Book Festival uh, has been a good example uh, of uh, a small town creating a niche uh, in cultural and tourist terms that perhaps can be copied elsewhere. I have the feeling there's room for a food town in the northeast of Scotland, uh, and, I, and I'd like to think that we might do something about it. Joan McAlpin, of course, is a debate on uh, food on, on Thursday. We've got lots of uh, locations that people come to, family connections. Richard Simpson uh, mentioned genealogy, and I've been studying genealogy in my family for over 50 years, and it helps me connect with history. My grandfather was born when Abraham Lincoln was president, and all my grandparents were born before the first secret ballot in a parliamentary election, which was in Pontefract on the 15th of August, uh, 1872. So when we study our family, we connect to our history, our antecedents, and that diaspora of 40 or 50 million uh, Scots around the world, I meet them coming here to study their family history. Members of my wife's family recently came across in New Zealand. They'd travelled from Scotland to Canada and eventually ended up in New Zealand. We didn't know they existed. And they came specifically uh, to study their family history. And in Aberdeen, in the Aberdeen and North East Scotland Family History Society, we have thousands of members there. Huge building full of information that people come to see. And I'm never in there, but that I hear voices of people who've traveled halfway around the globe uh, to research uh, their family history. In today's literature, uh, we've many places, uh, the, the literature and films, we've many places that attract tourists. In my constituency in Pennon, a year-round population of some 24, more than 30 years after the film Local Hero was filmed there, people still come to Pennon to look at the post box. It's needing a bit of TLC at the moment, and my uh, colleague uh, Ailey Whiteford is on that particular case. Uh, but the, the, the mark of a film, more than three decades old, is still there. The Oxford Bar, uh, the home to the fictional detective Inspector Rebus that Ian Rankin chose as the locale uh, for his drinking because he couldn't make it up, real life was even better, um, is something that tourists visit on the back of that. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, the public in there was a guy called Willie Ross when I first came to Edinburgh more than uh, 40 years ago, uh, who was somebody who was so antipathetic to the Edinburgh Festival. He used to shut the Oxford Bar for three weeks during the festival and put a notice up in the window saying, shut due to festival, very much the exception. And of course, um, on King George IV Bridge, uh, I was last week, I had a coffee in the Elephant House uh, where uh, the Harry Potter novels, uh, Potter novels had their genesis. We have a huge amount uh, in 
all our cities and all our areas of Scotland that drag people uh, from across the world. And we've had talk of the National Museum, um, the foundation stone of which was the very last public act of Prince Albert before he died uh, in the 1860s. Uh, I went there when I was a youngster. I can still remember things I saw there. Let's hope the cultural inheritance for those who come to Scotland today is as rich as I feel mine is. Presiding officer. Many thanks. And I now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I thank the cabinet secretary for her motion today and the opportunity to debate uh, these interesting issues around Scotland's many different cultures. Um, I'd also endorse both of the amendments. Uh, Claire Baker refers to culture counts, and I laid a motion uh, down which was supported, and where we really, I think, uh, over 40 different cultural organisations in Scotland are calling for recognition in the national performance framework so that we actually... Uh, begin to look at the kind of outcomes we might like to see uh, where culture really is at the heart of much of what we do. Um, they enjoy membership of over 50 of Scotland's organisations and uh, are driven to continue to make the case for recognition for the arts and uh, arts for all in, in every aspect. That's whether artists going into, into prisons to work on on reform and uh, or old folks' homes, poets and old folks' homes and so on, really making a difference to people's lives. And also to Liz Smith for highlighting the case for smaller cultural events and festivals. It's almost kind of easy to celebrate the success of Edinburgh's international festivals, all of them, uh, and so on, but perhaps overshadow sometimes some of the uh, importance of the much smaller festivals that are happening. And I know, I, I know that the Cabinet Secretary enjoys them just as much, but I make the case, really, uh, for them. Some time ago in this chamber, the Minister for Tourism, when announcing extra funding for promoting events through Event Scotland, um, he was reassuring to me um, at that time that smaller and more rural events should be recognised as important. And I would like to just reinforce that case again today. Indeed, um, the book festivals in Stornoway or Call, Ullapool or, or Lerwick um, do attract international visitors, but they may not uh, reach the 27% or 30% that's asked for in Event Scotland. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to check some of these figures because I wonder sometimes if the uh, bigger festivals or events that are, uh, that are given funding actually do any better. So I think um, it's really um, important, certainly in the area, area that I represent, and sometimes to recognise that culture is about, uh, or just exactly what it is about, it, it's about a way of life. And often that which really does attract the visitors to our country is maybe it is going to sheep shearing or maybe it's going to sheep dog trials and the Cayley at night. But who would deny that, that, that the enjoyment of that could be any greater than, than possibly an evening at, at the theatre in, during the Fringe? So I would like to see some of, some of these be given the kind of prominence that they deserve and also the importance that they undoubtedly have when it comes to uh, more rural festivals and um, events. Mention has been made too of the Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, Mila. I don't know what the plural of Mila is. Um, but I think we could also, we've, we, we, we've acknowledged the uh, cultural diversity of Scotland and I wonder too, Cabinet Secretary, if we should start to look perhaps at just how strong that is. Um, reading recently about the Gaelic community in Nova Scotia and the Scots taking their culture there. And I wonder how Scotland, how much does Scotland benefit from uh, the, the cultures that, are now, that now make up uh, part of, of our diverse populations? 
So are we engaging enough, maybe with the Polish or Lithuanian or Romanian uh, communities that are in our midst and I suspect would like to be uh, to take part, or perhaps would take part even more, across uh, smaller communities and more rural places. And I kind of, I guess, look forward to the day maybe when the traditional music awards include uh, traditional Polish songs or traditional uh, Latvian songs or Spanish or French or Dutch or Swiss um, of all of the different communities that, that make up our cultural diversity. And finally, I would just like to say that a couple of things. One was I, I had occasion to entertain some Norwegian politicians and, uh, in the Highlands and Islands looking at um, population change and uh, really how to keep young people in the Highlands. And they were impressed by organisations like the FACE, of course, um, and other things which were giving people a real sense of identity after a long time of really having their culture not recognised. But at one point I got a bit frustrated with them and, and as they Georgia, argued amongst themselves please. and asked them what they, I thought that Scotland might look, well, that Norway would look like in their ideal world and they immediately said Scotland. And when asked about that they said that uh, what country would not, that Scotland with its international recognition of its culture, that we have a culture that is worldwide, a song that's sung in every country around the world, of course, on Hogmanay. Um, but I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if we really enjoy the knowledge of some of that Great ourselves. Grateful if you could close, please. I think that my final plea would be that we start to recognise the many cultures in our country ourselves um, and that we acknowledge Excellent. that there's a great deal to, for us to learn and recognise in the, in the wealth of that culture. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Joan McAlpine, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, of which I have a member, recently conducted an inquiry into the economic impact of the creative industries. And what came across quite clearly, particularly during our early evidence gathering, was the huge impact that the creative industries made on the economy uh, too big to look at them all in sufficient uh, depth. Uh, we therefore concentrated on the impact of computer games, film and television. Uh, film and television um, is the way we reflect the cultural successes uh, and vibrancy that many members have highlighted today. So they are therefore particularly important. Um, however, um, the committee did find in its report that there is room for growth, particularly in film and television. Um, the flourishing culture we have seen in, in Scotland through our literature and performing arts, and national theatre and visual arts, has not necessarily been reflected on the small or large screen, and we need to look at viable ways for, uh, to, to tackle this problem. The committee, uh, in the area of television, which I wish to concentrate on, the committee heard that few Scottish independent producers are producing returnable television drama, which is a serious missed opportunity, given that this is a key sphere for building successful businesses. Uh, the lift and shift tactic uh, used mainly by the BBC was described as damaging to sustainable television production in Scotland. The term lift and shift describes the process of moving production of pre-existing shows to Scotland in order to meet quotas for Scottish-based output. Lift and shift provides, provides short-term production employment in Scotland but not sustainability. When production on the programme is complete and the cast and crew go back to London. The benefit of this work, such as financial profits and the key relationships between seller and buyer, remain in the South East with London-based producers. By contrast, Scottish-based producers here are here for the long term and they generate ideas and attract work into Scotland. Independent producers who came before the committee were quite unequivocal that London-centric commissioners are a huge obstacle for Scotland's TV and film industry. There is a wider point here in relation to the promotion of Scottish culture 
on television, and that is if commissioning is always commercially driven, productions of cultural value are more likely to be overlooked, particularly by London-based commissioners unfamiliar with Scottish work. For example, STV's Alan Clements told the committee the commissioners are the gatekeepers to the cash. Therefore, commissioning must be done by people who are aware of these books or movements. And producer Bob Last agreed, stating that we are talking about a cultural reality that needs active balancing. We perhaps need a new mechanism in which we promote material that is culturally important to Scotland, even if a commissioner in London does not think so. Some witnesses pointed to a confusion in the current devolved settlement, as well as the failure of the Smith Commission to devolve broadcasting. Independent producer Ken Hay advocated that the devolution of public sector broadcasters' production budgets, along with commissioning powers, was needed. At the very least, we need a commitment from broadcasters to scrap the lift and shift tactic in favour of proper investment in independent production companies with a permanent base in Scotland, and the committee has called upon the BBC and Channel 4 to adopt this new approach to commissioning by the end of 2016. Of course, culture extends beyond this screen industry, and uh, I wanted to move away from the committee report uh, for a moment uh, to look at the importance of festivals, which I know other members have talked about, but because... Um, there are a number of successful uh, festivals in my south of Scotland region and across Scotland. I wanted to draw attention to their cultural and economic importance. Um, festival goers visiting the south of Scotland region this year will be spoiled for choice. For example, there's the 14th Money Eye Folk Festival, which takes place next month and has a great lineup scheduled, including Whirly Gig. And this year's Radio Scotland Young Traditional Musician of the Year, Claire Hastings. We have the Wickerman Festival, also in its 14th year, which kicks off in Dundrennan in July. And in August, um, there is a smaller Rockerby Festival in the town of Lockerby, which uh, offers uh, fun and uh, around uh, rock bands, you wouldn't be surprised to hear. Of course, the biggest festival in Scotland is also a national treasure, and that's uh, Tea in the Park, which is now in its 22nd year. Um, it's the second largest festival in the UK, and we know that it generates 15.4 million for the Scottish economy and well over two, £2 million pounds at a local level. As members may be aware, plans to relocate the festival this year from its traditional home in Bellado to a new venue at Strathallan Castle were in doubt when rare birds were found nesting near the site. Happily, it now seems likely that the event will be able to go ahead as the experience team have made clear that they will adhere to environmental conditions to ensure the safety of the birds. I very much hope that this is the case, um, and I'm sure people do right across the chamber. It will be good news for the local economy and the Scottish economy, which benefit from this expenditure, and uh, to the fans, of course, who have a, a great, great time at the festival. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Cameron Buchanan, six, up to six minutes. I just remind all members that, who took part in the debate, be grateful if you'd like to return to the chamber now, please. Mr Buchanan, six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is clear to all that culture, visitor attractions and events are making a huge contribution to Scotland's economy and society. Be they daily, annual or even one-off, the various activities that we have to offer have a valued impact on our lives. Furthermore, I hope that all of us in this chamber can agree to welcome the hosting of international events in all Scottish venues. On another note, it is important to have the chance to celebrate our culture and boast proudly what the region I represent has to offer. Although cultural activities, tourism and events are often conflated, I feel it's important to shine a light on each aspect so that we can recognise their great economic and social value. We've recently discussed in this chamber the spectacular successes of the international sporting events hosted in Scotland last year, Commonwealth Games and Ryder Cup amongst them. It was evident that these international sporting occasions showcased Scotland to the world and provided a boost to many aspects of our tourist industry. I mentioned back then that it is important to add to this legacy, and in this regard, I welcome the, the recent announcement that Glasgow will be a host city for the multi-sport European Sports Championships, taking place in July and August 2018 to be co-hosted with Berlin. The combination of swimming, cycling, rowing and triathlon will showcase our capabilities internationally. I'm particularly looking forward to Edinburgh paying its part as well. It will come as little surprise to anyone in Scotland 
or the United Kingdom, that even the, or the world, to hear that Edinburgh's cultural makes a substantial contribution to the local and national economy. Although the city is famed for its festivals in the summer and winter, which I'll come to, you only have to travel around Edinburgh at any time to know that we attract tourists throughout the year. They are attracted by the rich variety of cultural offerings in the city, from whiskey tasting, kilt tailoring, to historical architecture, and of course captivating ghost tours. It is clear that our heritage accounts for a large proportion of the rich culture, which leads me to raise the interesting point that many visitors to Edinburgh come not only because they're interested in our heritage and diaspora, but also because they share it, which I think we've touched on with this um, genealogy. The shared appreciation of our culture truly enables locals to enjoy a great sense of pride in the city which they call home. As for visitor attractions, Edinburgh offers many that make marked contribution to both our economy and culture. It would, of course, be very difficult to discuss Edinburgh's attractions without mentioning the world-famous Edinburgh Castle, which, as we've heard from everybody, was recently voted the top UK heritage attraction in the British Travel Awards. Furthermore, its economic contribution as Scotland's number one paid-for tourist attraction gives a sustained boost to the city's economy. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to highlight every detail of the castle, but I must say I was particularly delighted when Monsberg recently restored its rightful place in pristine condition. I remember as a child clambering all over it and putting a footprint on it, <laughs> which fortunately came off very quickly. To give another example, the National Museum of Scotland provides an excellent cultural focus for residents and visitors. When we have a thriving tourist industry, its success drives new investment into the city, as the recently renovated Scottish whisky experience demonstrates. Although the term events could span all manner of occasions, I'd like to focus on two forms, festivals and sports. The multi-day Hogney Day Festival, which we know contributes around 32 million for the Scottish economy, is a shining example of an event that boasts the Scottish economy, particularly as it's repeated annually, for obvious reasons, in addition, Edinburgh's international reputation as an ideal location to welcome in the new year underlines our status as a first-class destination for cultural tourism. I remember many years ago when everywhere was shut at New Year and it was a desert. And it was fortunately thanks to, I think it was Pete Irvin of Unique Events who actually revived the tradition. Members will probably not be surprised to hear that I would also like to use this opportunity to put some focus on the Edinburgh International Festival and the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Edinburgh locals take a great pride in multiple aspects of the Edinburgh Festival for both economic and social reasons, and we should all applaud the people and organisations whose commitment enables such successful shows to be delivered time and time again. As for sports, our society benefits most when the legacy is secured after a high-profile sporting competition. In the Lothian region that I represent, one obvious example is the Royal Commonwealth Pool. Undoubtedly, the ability to use the swimming pool for exercise, leisure, or to teach children how to swim is the most welcome contribution to the, our society. With this in mind, I'm rather intrigued to discover what events may be hosted in Edinburgh as part of the multi-sport European sports championships, which are going to be taking place in July and August 2018. Accordingly, presiding officer, I welcome the chance to celebrate the economic and social contributions of Scotland's culture, visitor attractions, and events. They've all fostered our well-earned reputation as one of the best places in the world for arts, tourism and sports to flourish. I do hope that the economic impact of these sectors is monitored extensively and reported in the Scottish Parliament so we can be as informed as possible about it. On another level, it is clear that the prestigious events, festivals, shows and their legacies enrich Scotland society in a manner that we can all be proud of. I hope this debate and the attention it is bringing delivers some of the recognition that all of the people involved deserve for their invaluable contribution to Scotland's economy, our prosperity, our society and our international reputation. All of us in this chamber should do everything we can to support them. I therefore support the motion. Thank you. Thanks. I now call on Anne McTaggart. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And in closing today's debate for the Scottish Labour Party, I would like to say how fantastic it is to have this opportunity to discuss the huge contribution that Scotland's cultural and creative attractions make to our society, our economy and to our diversity as a nation. As we have heard in today's debate, last year was indeed an excellent one for Scottish cultural events. From culture 2014, with the branding designed by the superb Jim Lambie, we had brilliant events such as the Big Big Sing, 
the Blue Block Studio, which was a big hit across Scotland, and the amazing Tam Dean Byrne and his Julia Donaldson Cycling Marathon, which I had the pleasure of seeing recently at the Creative Scotland's recent reception in Parliament a few weeks ago. World leading artists and lo local communities working together all across the country once again demonstrated the best of Scotland's arts and culture. And I am sure we can agree across the Chamber that it showcased Scotland at its very best. Just as the Commonwealth Games brought some of the best athletes in the world to Scotland, Festival 2014 brought some of the world's finest entertainment and culture to Glasgow also. We, but we also had a bumper year for the Edinburgh Festival during the Games, achieving a record attendances and box office numbers, further cementing um, Scotland's place internationally as a nation of culture and the arts that is unrivalled on the world stage. And we were able to share this great celebration with guests from all around the world as Scotland saw a 10% increase in visitor numbers to Scottish attractions. But I am sure the question of all of us are asking is, how can we top that? And I am sure we all know it will be challenging. The world's eyes are always on Scotland's culture sector and time and time again, it punches well above its weight in the world. And this year promises to be no different. From the world of music, we've already had the amazing Celtic Connection Fest Festival, which once again showed why Scotland's bands are amongst the most influential in the world. Festivals, of course, and music festivals in particular, have played a crucial role in Scotland's cultural calendar for a number of years. Party at the Palace is back for 2015 this August at the stunning Linlithgow Palace. From smaller music festivals such as the Wickerman Festival, perhaps one of the Scotland's best loved independent music events, to the Belladrum Tartan Heart Festival and the Peerless Tea in the Park, which I am sure we can all agree that providing all relevant environmental safeguards are in place provides such a boost to Scotland's economy. And of course, in Glasgow, we once again welcome the World Pipe Band Championships back to Glasgow Green with over 300 live performances. And just to be plugged there, it's just to say that my amazing nieces and nephews will be taking part as pipers and drummers um, of the East Kilbride Pipe Band this year again. And all of these events and many more besides take place over the, the next year and will allow Scots across the country to harness the energy, friendship and enjoyment gained from what was the Commonwealth Games and continue into the next 12 months. Presiding officer, even we here in the Scottish Parliament are getting an enact. With Holyrood Rocks coming to Parliament with its launch event on Wednesday the 27th of May and the final taking place on Saturday the 31st of October. Holyrood Rocks will be a great way to harness the hugely positive energy gained from the Games and its related events to ensure that our young people know the importance of using their vote, particularly particularly our 16 and 17 year olds who will be voting in the Scottish Parliament elections for the first time next year. Presiding officer, we all feel proud across the chamber of our country's achievements last year and to watch our nation come together to celebrate the best Scotland has to offer with friends from all over the world and to do so with such vigour and good faith made me truly proud to be Scottish. I look forward to the events such as the Voluntary Arts Week in May 2015, which highlights the positive contribution to Scotland's vibrant cultural sector, made by our voluntary arts staff and volunteers throughout Scotland, and ensures that venues, creative hubs and organisations are accessible and welcoming to all as Neil Finlay had mentioned their importance earlier in his speech and also an ask of us all to remedy and support the ongoing dispute of some of our lowest paid staff. In conclusion, presiding officer, 2014 was indeed a momentous year 
for culture in Scotland. And not only because Dennis Robertson managed to get a song put together for Mr Q on the fiddle, or that Mark Griffin had highlighted the, cycle, the Commonwealth Games cycle path route in my bonny hometown of Moodysburn, or by us all trying to rush out to buy a train pass to Christine Graham's patch in the borders, or even by Mr McMillan showing us some of his literary skills, literacy skills, sorry, I can't even say that, in wish to draw to pronouncing repudiology. That was right. Sorry, presiding officer, yes, I will finish. But as I am sure we all can agree from across the chamber, there are promising signs to suggest that 2014 was no fluke. Today's debate has been interesting and has shown that there is real commitment to art and culture and poetry for Stuart Stevenson across the chamber and even in Scotland. Let's make sure 2014 is the rule rather than the exception. And with our continued support in this parliament, close, Scotland can continue to flourish creatively and culturally. Therefore, I fully support the motion and amendments placed today by Liz Smith and Claire Baker. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, didn't, I don't know if you, you knew that Hollywood rocks, but you do now after Anne McTaggart's contribution. Uh, I, I very much welcome the contributions from all the members who have spoken. It's clear that there is a shared appreciation of the contribution of culture and heritage, our visitor attractions and events to Scotland's economy, communities and our sense of well-being. Uh, the Government will be supporting the amendments uh, from the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, making important points about rural communities and also on volunteering um, and marking voluntary arts week. Uh, while Scotland is steeped in stories and histories, it is continually on the move, celebrating its past while seeking new and innovative ways to engage. And 2014 had a huge impact on Scotland's visitor economy in terms of income generated, but more importantly, events across Scotland enabled people to access, enjoy, participate in and benefit from a, a wide range of cultural activities. Creative Scotland fund and support a broad range of individuals and organisations across the cultural sector, helping to build capacity and deliver high quality work in communities across Scotland. But Claire Baker, in a very thoughtful speech, did pose the question, how wide and deep is that reach? And I think that's a very central point and a point I hope that this Parliament will continue to look at, examine and take forward. There were very important points in terms of that contribution in that area. Stuart Maxwell talked about the role of culture and the opportunities it provides to perhaps work particularly in the areas of mental health and particularly with men in particular. Um, and I think he's right to say we should be looking at the role of culture in tackling inequalities. And Richard Simpson talked about the prison population. And I remember seeing a, a fantastic uh, a performance in Green, uh, Greenock Prison, uh, supported by Citizens Theatre, uh, and where women had to examine themselves in front of an audience in terms of, that, of their experience. And, and that shows the power of culture is trans transformative. And it's something, again, I think we should come back to. Hanzala Malik uh, talked about the need to focus on minority communities. I have tasked Creative Scotland to look at what better we can do to help support and identify provision in that area. And Jean Urquhart quite rightly said, how are we looking at our communities, all the communities of Scotland? And I can say to her, I spent my St Andrews night celebrating a multicultural homecoming with performances from Polish, the Polish community in Scotland, the Irish community in Scotland, the Indian community. But she's quite right to say that should be something that becomes more of a norm in our, our exposition of what culture means in Scotland in the modern day. John Mason talked about Celtic connections and the importance of recognising and celebrating our Irish heritage. You might be keen to know that uh, I'll be attending the Celtic Media Festival this week because uh, the role of, of Gaelic culture and also how it's uh, demonstrated upon our screen is very important indeed. And in terms of how we make an impact and how we can transform the aspect of people having access, and I, I, I think looking at children and our young people in particular is a key area. That was a question posed by Claire Baker. We now have our first youth art strategy, Time to Shine. We have the Youth Music Initiative, and we have Cashback for Creativity. And all of them are working together, designed to ensure that no one's background is a barrier to taking part in cultural life. 
Time to Shine sets a, a, a whole range of, of recommendations to support children and young people flourish in arts. Uh, there is a 3.5 million youth arts development fund supporting nine youth arts hubs across Scotland. And they've been developed through partnerships between local and national arts and youth service providers. And they aim to engage with 40,000 children and young people. And a real strength that a lot of the hubs are being driven for by young people themselves. I had the pleasure recently of meeting those involved in the Highland Youth Arts Hub at Eden Court uh, and to hear about their exciting plans. I intend to visit all of the Youth Arts Hub in the future. Uh, in terms of our support, indeed, yes. Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is mentioning the hubs. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure us that uh, it, it, as many venues as possible can be fully accessible, not just for the people um, from maybe poorer backgrounds, but people with disabilities uh, having access to that? This is why, when I was talking in, in my, uh, my contribution, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I mentioned the, the importance of small local communities working together so there's full inclusiveness. Uh, I will indeed. Indeed, I, I'll make sure and come back to the member about details of how the youth arts hubs, in particular, will operate. Richard Simpson uh, talked about um, the big noise in Raplock, and I think in terms of increasing the confidence, the aspirations of self-esteem in our children and young people, transforming and uh, providing social regeneration, actually the impact ha has been quite profound. It's why we've helped Big Noise and El Sistema look at developing in other areas. It's why we've helped support them in Govan Hill. And Christian Allard to told us about the ambitions for Big Noise Torrey, which is due to formally launch at the end of June. A lot of the debate has also been about the economics and the economic contribution. Uh, Claire Baker, Joel McAlpine and Stuart Maxwell talked about the economic contribution of tea in the park. Uh, Liz Smith in her uh, amendment and her speech talked about rural sustainability and the virtuous circle between culture and having festivals locally and driving rural sustainability. She, she probably took the half glass empty view of the world because we also heard from Dennis Robertson about the vibrancy of, of, of Huntley and how it's using its culture in its community. Richard Simpson talked about East Newt Fife and, and also Christine Graham talked about uh, the Borders Rail Link and how that will open up the culture offer in the borders to others and wider fields. So I think there are opportunities, particularly in our rural communities, to grasp the opportunity of cultural festivals to take things forward. But that's not just the responsibility or the role for funding from the national cultural budget. That also is a responsibility of local authorities but also I think the important point about the role of private investment in this I know in one of my own towns the Bathgate Music Festival was actually the initiative of the local business community recognizing that the increased footfall would be a benefit um, to that area but we have to invest in order to, to help support our, our cultural uh, provision. The Theatre Royal has now opened a refurbished Theatre Royal with a contribution from the Scottish Government. The Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, the home of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, remember, who played such an important part in the contribution to the Commonwealth Games cultural programme. If you look at our national collections, we've got significant projects at Causeway Side, at Kelvin Hall, and also at the Arch Conservation Facility. And Claire Baker referred to the National Theatre of Scotland, of of course, the theatre without walls, which does have access and, and makes sure that their provision is seen by many across the country, uh, the theatre without walls, and we've seen the, uh, the, the provision of a facility to help a creativity hub for them in terms of what they can offer in the theatre and the proposals there. So we also want to bring culture to new audiences. I've, I've empowered the national performing companies to make sure that they take their high quality work across the country. Uh, President Officer, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Stuart Stratford, who was appointed today as the new Scottish Opera Music Director. Uh, we are seeing uh, many of our national uh, companies performing overseas. David Gregg's play Dunsinane is going to the US and is there, has been there uh, to great acclaim. But interestingly, received an audience of, uh, of uh, uh, 125,000 on Radio 3, which would have been the equivalent of a seller of 200 consecutive performances to match that number at the Lyceum. There is much to look forward to. 2015, the year of food and drink. We've got the Orkney Folk Festival, the Glasgow Science Festival, the Borders Book Festival, Cake Fest, 
Edinburgh and, of course, many of the themed years in the years ahead. Uh, to go back to the theme of transformation, culture can transform rural communities in terms of its festivals, it can transform lives of individuals, it can transform communities and also the economy. Uh, I very much look forward to taking this agenda forward and I thank all members who have spoken for I think what has been a very lively and informed debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the contribution of culture, visitor attraction and events to Scotland's economy and society. Before we move to decision time, I invite members to join me in welcome to the gallery Her Excellency Teresita Vicente, the Ambassador of the Republic of Cuba. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12958.2 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 12958 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the contribution of culture, visitor attractions and events to Scotland's economy and society be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12958.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 12958 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the contribution of culture, visitor attractions and events to Scotland's economy and society be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12958 in the name of Fiona Hislop as amended twice on the contribution of culture, visitor attractions and events to Scotland's economy and society be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.